truly God has blessed us to be here this morning, yes, sir. assembled yes. with one another in his presence mm -hmm. to the purpose of worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Amen. And for that, we should always be thankful. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful to the leadership here at the Hubsmith Church of Christ for extending to me uh, another opportunity to share a message with you from God's holy and divine word. Uh, we're thankful for all of the prayers that have been prayed, the songs that have been sung, the scriptures that have been read, and we also thank everyone in advance who will be leading us throughout the remainder of service. Isn't God good? Yes, He is, my brother. God is so good that He does what He does for us, that He blesses us, not because of who we are, but because of who He is. Amen. Because we not always, amen, somebody. Amen. We not always so easily blessable, if you will. Yeah, you ever met somebody who yes. just wasn't so easily blessable? Yes, sir. No matter how much you're good, how good you are to them, how nice you are to them, they find a problem. Amen. Amen. Right. I was talking to uh, Rosemary and I were talking the other day. Said, you know, there are some people. You could give them a piece of gold, and they'll say it's not shiny. Uh -huh. <laughs> But God is so good that he blesses us yeah. and loves us yeah. because of who he is yes, sir. and not because of who we are. Yeah. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse number 27. In Mark chapter 15. Listen to what the Bible says. <clears throat> with him they also crucified two robbers one on his right and the other on his left so the scripture was fulfilled which says and he was numbered with the transgressors and those who passed by blasphemed him wagging their heads and saying aha you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. And likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Verse 39. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed, he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from afar. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. The title of the message is At the Cross. At the Cross. Now, we look at the passage. We see Jesus on the cross between two thieves and people pass by all had something to say. You destroy the temple, now you come on down. If you have that much courage to say you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, this sacred temple and you got this much bravado and this much confidence and this much power. You come on down off that cross. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then we see in verse 31 that not only were just the passers-by mocking Jesus, but you see the priests, you, you see the preachers, the people who represented religious authority, the people who were the face of religion, saying among themselves along with the scribes, and li listen to the sarcasm at this church. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross 
that we may see and believe. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see the sarcasm in that? They didn't believe who he was, who he said he was. Mm -hmm. Had an opportunity to speak to the exoner, but they said, "If he is who he says he is, let him let us see him get off the cross right now, mm -hmm. so that we could believe him." And then we also see in the latter part of, uh, of verse thirty-two, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know about you, but if I'm facing death. I'm reaching for everything that I can get my hands on to stay alive. Hmm. Yeah. So they're in the same boat with him, facing death on the cross, but had something to say about him. Hmm. And we'll look at that more in detail because he told one of those thieves that he would see him in paradise. But then as we scroll down, we see other onlookers. We see a Roman soldier who was there who acknowledged that Jesus was the Son of God. We also see in verse 40, there were also women looking from afar, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James. And in verse 41, we see uh, the women who were of Galilee. Verse 41, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So we see that Jesus, while he was on the cross, that it attracted some attention. Mm -hmm. It attracted a crowd, if you will. This, this event, this, this event of Jesus being on the cross, just stay with me for a moment, okay. of Jesus being on the cross, mm -hmm. it was an attraction. Right. And we even sing about... Uh, which took place when we sing the song at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and, and how this event was such, uh, such an extraordinary event that it's even still relevant for us today. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes my brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're not careful, we will take events, we will allow events to become uh, less significant than they are in our minds. For example, we sing at the cross, and sometimes we, if we're not careful, we could just say, hey, that event happened at the cross, and we sing about it. And it was a good event that happened during that time, but that event was more than just a good event. Yes, crucifixions were something that took place during that time, but it was just something special and unique about the crucifixion of Jesus yeah. that gives us hope that hope that we're able to benefit from even today. Mm -hmm. Who was at the cross, we may ask? Well, because there was a large crowd, people could assume that everybody was there. Right. But let's take a closer look at this multitude, because we one thing that we know about Jesus' earthly ministry, it was not uncommon for him to attract crowds. Right. In Capernaum, thou he attracted the crowd. When he talked by the seaside, he attracted a crowd. And even on the day of his death on Calvary, he attracted a crowd. In this multitude, we see men present, religious leaders, the thieves who were crucified along with him, and the Roman soldiers who were the legal executioners during this time. We even see the women who were acknowledged, Mary Magdalene. We see Mary, who was the mother of James. And then over in the book of John, we even see Mary, who was his mother. We see the women of Galilee there. And one may ask, what is it about an event that draws a crowd? And I'm mindful of a quote that was shared by a lady by the name of, uh, of uh, Jean Dolores Schmidt. She was a chaplain at Loyola, Chicago, uh, a few years back when they made it to the NCAA tournament. And she was asked, what is it about an event that attracts people? She said, what makes an event attractive is when people want to see something new, something unexpected, and something wonderful. And when we look at this crucifixion, even though the crucifixion was uh, not new, it was not a new method of execution, but the one who was being crucified this day was a new victim. Right. Even though it was a new victim. And what was unexpected about this crucifixion 
is that Jesus, a person who had done nothing but good, was put to death. And this event was a wonderful event. It was wonderful for us later on because we benefited from it, but in that immediate present moment, it was wonderful for those who felt that Jesus was a threat to their authority and who had seen him as someone evil. They, yes, they verbally degraded him. Yes, he was beaten. Yes, he was humiliated. He was even called a demon in John chapter 8. But they forgot one thing while they were putting him down. What they forgot is what he said in John 12, 32, which is, If I be lifted up, that I will draw all men unto me. Right. Yes, they put, yes, they beat him down. Yes, they put nails in his hands and feet. Yes, they did everything to destroy him and humiliate him publicly. But they didn't know that while they were putting him down, that they were also lifting him up. Right. People were there at the cross for a different reason. Mm -hmm. And people follow us and get attached to us, my brothers and sisters, for different reasons. In spite of the reasons they were there, they were still in the presence of Jesus. Yeah. Why were the thieves there? They were not there because they wanted to be there. They were there as a consequence of their action. Mm -hmm. And isn't it odd sometimes how we can make bad decisions and, and, and the consequences of our actions yeah. are the ones that can cause us to fall on our knees and want to get closer to Jesus. Right. Have we ever done something that was really bad and really terrible that we wish we could run away from because we saw the damage unfolding and we saw the consequences that we did not see when we were in the moment acting out. Right. And it is the anticipation and the fear of the, of the impact of those consequences that bring us to our knees and say, Lord, I messed up, but I need you to have a little mercy on me right now. Lord, I messed up, but I need you to forgive me right now. And so like these thieves, their consequences brought them into the presence of Jesus. Hmm. Then we have uh, the multitude who was there, the people who just wanted to see what was happening. We would call them nosy. Or if we wanted to be fancy with them, we would call them being there because they were socially obligated. Mm -hmm. They were driven to be there on Calvary more because of sociology than they were theology. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see what was going on and what the hype was all about. They had seen and heard about this Jesus and they wanted to see if they would heard about the miracles that he had performed, but they wanted to see if this same Jesus who was on the cross was going to be as bold, courageous, and, and this same miracle performing person that he was before he got there. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes we can be just like the crowd. Sometimes we can be more interested in attaching ourselves to God's people for social reasons than godly reasons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our sociology can drive us to do church more than our theology. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that, Brother Thorne? When it comes to doing things that are right or wrong, sometimes we can back away from those things that are right because we're worried about what people are going to say about us. Not necessarily the people who are outside the four walls, but people who are within the four walls. If you don't believe me, what, 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 if you do not believe me, let us challenge a tradition that's been in place for all of years. Let us challenge things that we know that we've done out of tradition and custom that may not necessarily be a biblical directive. And we say, well, I don't want to get mixed up in that because people are going to accuse us of this. And people are going to accuse us of that. Well, let me drop this on you while I'm here. People did not call us by the gospel. The God of heaven did. And if it is him that we're going to serve, we need to make up our minds that we're going to be attached to Jesus because of theology instead of sociology. Yeah. There's no salvation in sociology. Yeah. There's salvation in theology. Yeah. There's salvation in the knowledge that we have about God and what he has done for us. Right. There were people who were also there because of legal obligation. Mm -hmm. The Roman soldiers were there. In John chapter 18, it was not lawful for Jews to perform their own executions. So the Roman soldiers who represented uh, the law, who were the law enforcers, the law enforcement agents, if you will, they were there out of legal obligation. But they were also there for another reason, my brothers and sisters. Please turn to Mark chapter 15, 24. I want us to see something really quick. The Bible says, and when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Please walk back with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And let's look at what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 27 around verse number 35. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots. 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the Roman soldiers were not only there because of legal obligation, but they were there because it was prophetically spoken. If you will, they were prophetically obligated. The Bible still tells us that God's word doesn't become void. So what he says is going to happen, it will happen. Amen. And if you are a part of that scheme, whether you realize it or not, you have an attachment to that scheme and there's nothing you can do to derail that plan. So they were there legally, but they were also there prophetically. Why? Because we just read the reference in Matthew that correlates with Psalm 22, 18, that while they were there, would have, they divided his clothes to fulfill what the prophecy had said about him. We also see Mary Magdalene who was there. And the Bible teaches us, please turn with me to, uh, to Luke, Luke chapter 8, if you will. Luke chapter 8, just be with me, just stay with me. I'm headed somewhere with all of this. In Luke chapter 8, verse number 2, in Luke chapter 8, and a certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Now we see that she was there, and why was she there? She was there out of obligation. What obligation? An obligation of gratefulness. Why do you say that? Because of appreciation, she stuck in there and hung on in there with Jesus. Yes, and my brothers and sisters in Christ, I know that we deal with a lot of things in our lives from time to time, but do not allow the problems in life to cause us to be ungrateful for the things that God has done. Yes. Uh, if we cannot attach ourselves to Jesus for any other reason, we ought to be willing to attach ourselves to him out of an obligation of gratefulness. Am I making sense this morning? If it, look here, look here. The Bible teaches us that we are to give thanks always, right? That means whether things are good or bad, we can be thankful. Be thankful for the good. And when things are not good, be thankful that, as we, I've mentioned here before when I've preached to you and, and worshiped with you, be thankful for things being as well with us as they are, even when they're not as good as, they, as we may want them to be. So we have an obligation of gratefulness, and if for no other reason we should attach ourselves to Jesus because we are grateful for what he has done. Yes. What did he do that was so that is worthy of gratefulness? He had our sins washed away mm -hmm. and has given us an, an access, rather, to eternal life. Yes. What greater gift can someone offer? Mm -hmm. What greater thing can someone do for us? Someone could bless us with a car, but a car will break down eventually. Right. Somebody could bless us with a nice home, but homes and the materials in the homes will deteriorate. People can bless us with money. If we don't manage it correctly and properly, we can lose it all. Or if we don't have, or we can have an illness and an illness can wipe finances out. I was just talking to somebody real close to me who spent a week in a hospital because of COVID. I mean, actually less than a week, they spent five days. And they told, and he said to me, he said, man, you know how much my medical bill is? Mm. And I was only there five days, $90,000 for a hospital visit, only five days. Right. And so I'm saying that to say that even if someone did bless us with money, an illness can wipe that money out. Mm. Five days, 90 Gs. Imagine what six or seven months would be. And there are people who man somebody Amen. who are in that hospital for that length of time. And then when you calculate the aftercare, there's, there, there are costs associated with that. So we have a reason to be grateful that, that with Jesus, if for nothing else, that he opened up the gateway for us to have salvation in him, yeah. which could bless us not only now, but benefit us throughout eternity. Mm -hmm. There were other people who were there. We also see, uh, we also know that Mary, his mother, was there. Why was she there? Because it was because she had a maternal obligation. That was his mama. We know that the bond between mama and child is one that is very strong and difficult and almost impossible to break. Yeah. Let me help you understand where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. This is something that I'll never experience because I am a male. I don't have the ability to give birth, but I will share with you some, some facts associated with being a mother that I'm sure mothers would say amen and identify with. Mm -hmm. when, a mother when a woman decides to give birth to a child and that birth occurs, it's time for that child to come. She goes to death's doorstep. She deals with excruciating pain. 
not knowing if she's going to live or if she's going to die, but she's going to do everything within her power during that birthing process, no matter how much pain she's in, to make sure that that baby exits her body in the best health, in the best possible shape that he or she can. I see mothers shaking their heads, yes. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it's uncomfortable. But the whole time that mother is going through that process, she's thinking about the well-being of a child. Mm. And I want to say this to us right now. If the fear of death and being close to death will not deter a mother's concern for her child, amen, somebody, then I cannot think of anything else that would break that bond. Mm. I cannot think of amen, somebody. Y'all making this too difficult for me this morning, y'all. If a lady does, and, and then we have mothers who have multiple children, mm -hmm. which means they volunteer to risk their lives multiple times. All right. All right. <laughs> volunteer to risk their lives multiple times. Mm -hmm. And throughout that process, which each and every child, they have the child's well-being as top priority, even above their own lives. Mm -hmm. That's what you call a maternal bond. Yes. That's what you call a maternal obligation. Yes. And we see Mary, she rolled with us, son, even until the end. I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but I imagine it was pretty painful for her to see her son on the cross, to hear the bad things that people said about him, to see the blood, amen, somebody, drooling from his body, and to see all and to see the remnants of the beating that he took before he got on the cross. But nevertheless, she loved that son so much that she wasn't just going to leave him hanging on Calvary by himself. Right. She was there with him yeah. and was loyal to him until the end. Right. She had a maternal obligation. Am I making sense this morning, y'all? So as we look at this, this, this cross, this event that gathered people, everyone who was there was impacted differently by his death. The multitude who wanted something to talk about they got what they needed. They got what they came there for. I can imagine them the next day. Yeah, that Jesus who gave sight to the blind. That Jesus who said he was the son of God. That Jesus who said he would destroy the temple and rebuild it. Yeah, he got what he deserved. He didn't get off that cross. If he was so tough and he was so bad and he was all, and if he was all that he said he was, uh -huh. he, he, he wasn't better than the Roman soldiers right. because he stayed down and didn't come down. I imagine the religious leaders had some level of contentment because he threatened their authority and he was a threat to their teaching. And I imagine that they had some level of contentment. Well, we had it right all along because if he was the son of God, he would have gotten down off that cross. Then I could hear the, uh, I could also see the people who were there, who, who, got, who were there for other reasons. I see the women who followed him. The women who are mentioned last in the series of, in the series of events listed in Mark. But after the resurrection, they are among the first to be mentioned. They are they exemplify what the Lord said in Luke 13, 30, that he who is first shall be last, mm -hmm. and he who is last shall be first. I see the women of Galilee who hung in there with him. They were there not because they were promised a position, but they were there because they were servants. And I imagine they, they felt validated because they demonstrated their loyalty to Jesus as servants to the end. Mm -hmm. And let me say something about our sisters while we're here. All right. The ladies in the church are here because they want to be here. They cannot serve as deacons, cannot serve as elders. Mm -hmm. Biblically speaking, they have a specific role. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in spite of the fact that that role is not an upfront and visible one, you see more of them in church than you see men. Amen. Amen. And not only do you see more of them in church than you see men, they, they come, they're committed, they're loyal, not only with their presence, but with resources, intellectual, financial, and everything else that God has blessed them with. They contribute to the Lord's body. 
They are the unsung heroes of the Lord's church, if you will. And I'm not saying this to try to get brownie points with ladies. I'm just telling you like it is. You can go to any congregation, and I guarantee you'll find more women in there than men. And they're there because they want to be there. They're there because they've made the decision to serve the Lord. Sometimes it's brethren. Sometimes it's brethren. Sometimes it's brethren. Opportunities to be out front cloud that commit that, that, that commitment to serve. Sometimes that opportunity can cloud that. But if you want to know how, be, how to be a good servant of the Lord, then look no further than the sister who's sitting closest to you. Well, I thought we would have a whole lot more amens on that. Oh, I see what it is. The mask, that's what it is. The mask of filtering. All right, just, just nod your head when you can. How was Mary, the mother of Jesus, impacted? She was impacted not only because she saw her biological son die, but she was blessed with a new son. My church family, please turn with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse number 25 in John chapter 19. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Now, I want you to see the impact of this. Mary, the mother of Jesus, being a mother devastated because of what her son endured. But I want you to see the son saying, Mama, even though I'm not going to be here, I'm going to make sure you're going to be all right. Hmm. Mother, behold your son. Son, take care of your mother. And from that day forward, John took care of his mother. Church family, one of the things about being a child of God is not only do we have a relationship with him, but it is our relationship with each other that is powerful as well. Amen. We are a part of each other's village. This is why Paul said in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who, re who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Why? Because we are connected to Christ, as a result of that, we are connected to each other. Amen. And because of our connection, we can hold, we can, we, can, we can behold each other as mothers and sons, daughters, sisters, and brothers. Amen. And because of that connection, we can live out the words, rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. Because of that connection, what hurts you hurts me. All right. Because of my connection to you, what gives you joy brings me joy. Mm -hmm. Because of my connection to you, what causes your mind to be troubled should cause mine to be troubled. Because of my connection to you, whatever it is you love, I should love. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we are all connected through Jesus Christ. All right. The impact of the Lord's death. We know that the story doesn't end on Calvary. Mm -hmm. We know that there are many people who died. Some who died by crucifixion. We know that there were a whole lot of people who were buried. But what makes Jesus' experience so different, in spite of the fact that he died, in spite of the fact that he experienced crucifixion, was that he got up out of his grave all by himself. Unlike Lazarus, who was resurrected to die again, Jesus was resurrected to die no more. The Bible lets us know that 
while he was on that cross and that blood was released from his body, that blood assured us that God was at work because it is through the blood of Christ that our sin was washed away. It was because of his actions, his death, burial, and resurrection that our hope was revealed to us. It is because of his actions, his death, burial, and his resurrection that we know what an unfiltered demonstration of love looks like. It's because of his actions, his death, burial, and resurrection, his unwillingness to come down from the cross, and his commitment that kept him from calling angels to come and handle the situation that lets us know that it's okay to be faithful to God even in the face of impossibility because God's will will be done. Yes, and because of what Jesus did on the cross, yeah. it causes us to have a greater appreciation for that song that we sing, that chorus that says, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart were rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart was rolled away. How were they rolled away? Because Jesus took care of them. It was there by faith I received my sight. My faith in what God said would happen helped me to see beyond the immediate and it still causes me to see beyond the immediate. That's why we're told in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we walk by faith and not by sight. It was there by faith. I, amen, somebody. And then it goes on in that song that says, uh, uh, it was there by faith. I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. I got a reason to rejoice because I know everything's going to be all right. Amen. I got a reason to rejoice, to know that my hope is not limited to earthly events and earthly experiences. Yes. I have a reason to rejoice, mm -hmm. to know that my end all is not here, but one day I'm going to have a new body. One day you and I will have a new body, yes. and one day we will be able to celebrate Celebrate that day when our faith will be sight. Right. What do you mean faith will be sight? When we will be able to see the salvation yeah. that was promised to us yeah. and participate in the in the ongoing celebration that, that was promised to us as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you this morning, church, but that's something that's so that right there is enough to keep me going. Yeah. That right there is enough to put up with a little stuff every now and then. Sure. 